Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new here, hi, my name is Alia. I have a master's degree in aerospace engineering and I make videos on aerospace engineering related topics every Thursday. Today, we finally start talking about propulsion and we'll start with aircraft propulsion. Remember in one of my previous videos, we talked about the four forces that act on the aircraft and thrust was the force that enables the aircraft to move forward. Today we will learn where this thrust force comes from and how to derive the equation for it. We will use Newton's second and third laws as usual to do that. To describe it simply, thrust is generated when the air is pushed out of the engine and in order to balance for that momentum of this air, the engine and with it the aircraft is pushed in the opposite direction, which is forward. It's like a jetpack for astronauts, which makes them move up, even though the jet itself is going downwards. Okay, but how do we push the air out of the engine? First, let's look at the internal structure of the engine. And here in the picture, you can see a schematic of a typical turbojet engine, and we will talk about all other types of engines in a separate video, but this one will do as it is the most common engine out there. So you see it has four main parts, which are the compressor, the combustion chamber, the turbine, and the nozzle. We can also define the inlet and the outlet of the engine, or we call them inlet and exit, or inlet and exhaust, whichever you prefer, but we'll just call it one and two, in our derivation later. So what happens with the air as it goes through the engine? First, the air goes into a compressor and you can see from its name that it compresses the air, meaning that it increases the pressure and the temperature of air. Then this hot and pressurized air goes into a combustion chamber. And inside the combustion chamber, we also add some fuel. And because the air is so hot and pressurized, the fuel starts burning. So the air becomes even hotter and even more pressurized. You can think of it as a small explosion inside the engine, inside the combustion chamber. And this air wants to leave the engine. It expands. So how does it do it? It goes into a turbine. As the air goes through the blades of the turbine, it rotates the turbine. And you see that the turbine is connected to the shaft, which also starts rotating, and the shaft is connected to the compressor, so the compressor is rotating. So you can see how we save a little bit of energy just by attaching the turbine and the compressor on the same shaft. In the turbine, the air cools down and reduces the pressure a little bit. And finally, the air goes into a nozzle, and you see that the nozzle has a small area for the outlet or the exit. And this is essential to generate the thrust. Remember from Bernoulli's principle that when the fluid or a gas goes through a region with lower area, smaller area, then the velocity of that fluid increases. So the air that exits the engine has a higher velocity than the air entering the engine. So the engine acts like an accelerator. And this change in velocity means that we change the momentum of the air. It means that we create an outside force, which we'll later call thrust. All right, now let's go ahead and derive the equation for thrust. We will start by looking at a general control volume that has a larger area for the inlet or the entrance than the exit. This is essential to generate thrust or the change of momentum. And it's true for both aircraft and rocket engines, but we'll look into rocket engine thrust in the next video. So the air flows through this control volume, and because it accelerates through the exit, it creates a force that acts in the direction of the air, which is to the right in our picture. I know it is the opposite to thrust force, but you will understand by the end of this video why we say that. Let's call this force capital F. Now, if you recall Newton's second law, you remember that the acceleration of an object is proportional to the magnitude and direction of the force that's acting on it. And we saw this formula in the previous video as well. But actually, this is a simplified case for a generalized Newton's second law. The generalized Newton's second law looks like this. 
where on the left we have the sum of the forces acting on the object. So this is basically the net force in a vector form that we get on an object. And on the right side we have the time derivative of momentum. So this generalized Newton's second law takes care of many more cases. For example, when the mass of an object is changing, as we will see with the rocket equation. Okay, now let's try to simplify this equation. Let's start with the right-hand side. When we talk about the time derivative of momentum, we can think about it as the change of momentum between two points in time and space. So let's keep the time derivative in the denominator, but change the change of momentum in the numerator. So dmv means the change of momentum between two points. And we can take the first point as the inlet of the engine and the second point as an outlet or exit. So now we can rewrite it as a difference of two momentums, mv2 and mv1. Okay, now we can divide each term by dt because it's a common denominator and get two fractions which are subtracted. We can also open the brackets and say that mv1 equals to m1v1 and mv2 equals to m2v2. Now remember that the change in mass over time is the mass flow rate, as we discussed in the video about the principle of continuity. And so instead of mass over dt, we can say it's a m dot. So we'll get m2 dot v2 minus m1 dot v1. Now remember the principle of continuity. The mass flow rate of air that enters the control volume is equal to the mass flow rate of air that exits. So the mass flow rate is actually the same because none of the air accumulates inside the engine. Whatever enters it, exits it. So actually, m1 dot is equal to m2 dot. And so let's call it just m dot and plug it into the equation. Now, because we have m dot in both of the terms, we can factor it out and we'll get an expression like this, m dot times v2 minus v1. So this is what we get on the right-hand side of our equation. And this expression means it's the change of momentum of the air as it passes through the control volume with a decreasing exit area. And notice how the velocities don't have the same value. When the air exits the engine, its velocity is always higher than when it enters it. And one more thing to add here is that, remember, we said that the principle of continuity holds, but in reality, inside the engine, we also add some fuel, but the mass flow rate of fuel is so little compared to the mass flow rate of the air that we can neglect it for the purpose of derivation of this equation. But in real problems about calculating thrust, we have to include the mass flow rate of the fuel as well. Okay, now let's talk about the left-hand side of the equation, which equals to the sum of the forces. What forces act on this control volume, or the engine? We know there's one of them, which we called F, that the air generates because it changes its momentum. So one force is already there, but we also have forces due to pressure change. Remember when we talked about the exit area being smaller than the inlet area, we said that the velocity of the air increases. So that means that the static pressure at the exit or the outlet should be lower than the static pressure at the inlet of the engine. So we have to accommodate for the change in pressure. But how do we relate pressure and force? Because in the equation we have the sum of forces. Now remember, pressure is just how much you push something. So if we have the same force, but the areas are different, then the pressure will be higher on the smaller area. So if we rearrange this equation for pressure, we obtain the force that's equal to pressure times area. And we just talked about static pressures at the inlet and the outlet of the engine. So we can use those two along with the areas of the inlet and the exit of the control volume or the engine. So at the inlet, we get this force acting in the direction of air on our control volume. And at the outlet, we get the opposite pointing force that is also equal to the pressure times area of the nozzle. So in total, if we collect all those forces acting on the control volume or the engine, we get three forces where two of them are 
represented by pressure and area. So now if we collect the whole equation that we started with, which is Newton's second law, and plug back in all the expressions that we derived, we get an expression that looks like this. Now let's think about this force for a second. This is the force that the air creates when it leaves the engine. But don't forget Newton's third law. If we have a force that acts in the direction of the airflow, then in order to balance this force, we have to have an equal and opposite reaction. And so we get the new force that opposes the force F that we just derived. And the opposite force is directed forward, which we call thrust. And this is how thrust is created. In the next video, we'll look into how rocket thrust is different from aircraft thrust. And that's it for today. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like it and share it with your friends. You can also check out my other videos here. And thank you so much for watching and see you in the next one.